So the A-Probio uh, is the Alliance for Education on Probiotics. Um, it's dedicated to establishing probiotics as a frontline therapy uh, to protect, restore, and enhance uh, human health. Um, A-Probio is a trusted global resource for evidence-based information on probiotic products. And the Alliance uh, provides healthcare professionals with essential information and tools to effectively integrate the use of probiotics in their practice. One of the major goals is to enhance the overall understanding of probiotics by validating and asserting the benefits uh, probiotics can offer to preserve med medicines, to public health dollars and human resources. We also would like to thank uh, Nestle uh, Nutrition. Uh, before we dive into this presentation, it's really great to acknowledge that this session has been made possible through unrestricted educational grant from Nestle Nutrition. And we appreciate their support and encourage you to join us in thanking them for bringing us together today. So for today's sessions, um, basically we, most of us know that lifelong health relies on the first days following conception and in the early month of child's life. So today we have Dr. Nardine Nakla and Dr. Christine Connor with us. They will provide us with the current reliable information you can take back and help your clients understand how to give their babies the best start for a long and healthy life. Today, we will explore how mother's diet and microbiota impact the development of fetus and infant's microbiota, the importance, benefits, and potential complications that are associated with breastfeeding, the safe and effective integration of probiotics to support breastfeeding, and also look at the evidence for probiotic use in early days in infancy. So now let's move um, to the reason that we are here. I should stop talking and I'd like to introduce you to our first of two speakers, Dr. Kristen Connor. Uh, Dr. Connor is an associate professor of developmental origins of health and disease in the Department of Health Sciences at Carleton University where she runs research program to understand developmental trajectories in early life and how these trajectories are established and modified to influence individuals' lifelong health, resilience, or disease risk. Dr. Connor is molecular geneticist and a nutritionist by first training at University of Belt, and she obtained a doctorate in reproductive and developmental physiology in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Toronto. Um, Vita, uh, where she conducted research, and she was a research fellow and investigator at the Liggins Institute and the National Research Center for Growth and Development in Auckland, New Zealand. And she's senior research fellow at the Lennonfeld Tenenbaum Research Institute at Mount Sinai Hospital in Toronto, where she currently conducts her human clinical research. She works with investigators nationally and in, in, internationally, obviously. So, um, Dr. Connor's research aims to understand how the early life environment, including nutrition, influences maternal health, fetal or infant development, and risk of chronic disease in offspring. Um, she specifically uh, focuses on understanding how early life exposures influence resident microbes and impact the development of placenta and fetus and child, including the gut and brain, and how probiotics and microbe targeting interventions may optimize pregnancy and offspring development and health. She's funded through national agencies, including the CIHR, NSERC, and Molly Tau Perinatal Research Foundation, amongst others. Now that you know a bit more about your first experts, let's get started. And I'd like to welcome Dr. Connor. Thank you so much, Dragana, for that introduction. Um, I'm really excited today to be able to talk about the importance of the environments we experience in early life and how they have substantial influence on our health throughout the life course. And certainly whether we can even capitalize on these early windows to optimize health. So by the end of this session today, you should be able to explain why early life environments are critical for life cycle health describe when and where microbes may be involved in reproduction, pregnancy, and development, 
demonstrate uh, which environmental factors might be critically important in influencing both maternal and child microbiomes, as well as discussing the benefits for maternal child health. So first, let's have a primer on the importance of the first thousand days, which includes nutrition, because we know pregnant people are some of the most nutritionally vulnerable groups and how microbes fit into this story. And it's important to start off by first saying that pregnancy health and the health of the developing fetus and eventually the child doesn't start at conception. In fact, our health trajectories have an origin uh, far earlier than that. And this means we need to be aware of our environments across the life cycle, which includes the preconception period. And this applies not only to mothers and adolescent girls uh, long before they contemplate pregnancy, but also to boys, men, and fathers. And as well, we must consider the period very early in pregnancy, where even though it's a time uh, when the nutritional requirements of the embryo and fetus are incredibly small, it's also incredibly important for ensuring maternal health and uh, placental development and function. And of course, the fourth trimester, the postpartum period, is a time for early feeding practices, behaviors, acquisition of nutrients. And this window also offers us the possibility to correct paths that have been set prenatally or even periconceptionally, or allows us to act in a way that can maintain an optimal course. So this idea that health is um, uh, develop, health and development are, are established early comes from a concept called developmental programming or the developmental origins of disease. And this is defined as a stimulus or an insult that operates during a critical or sensitive period of development that could result in long-term effects on the structure or the function of the organism. And these stimuli are many, but roughly fall under exposures related to inflammation, xenobiotics, uh, stress, and of course, nutrients. And these exposures interact with our genes, our microbes, our epigenome, and our environments to elicit the phenotypes that we see. And whilst these are biological factors that I'm presenting here, of course, we know that they are influenced and brought about by social, structural, and environmental contexts. So we know that pregnancy is an important time for increased uh, nutrient requirements to ensure optimal pregnancy health and fetal development. But in addition to nutrition, microbes and their metabolites are likely to be another critical factor, providing amongst other things, um, nutrients, immune protection, and uh, generally regulating host physiology. And in fact, some reports suggest that even if all the current knowledge were applied to improve the nutrition of pregnant women and their babies, outcomes like poor growth and development may only be ameliorated by about 30%. And additionally, we know that uh, the placenta is important and placental function and vascular flows are essential for the regulation of fetal growth, but it's not easy to see how these can be corrected to optimize development in utero. And of course, due to the potential for reproductive or developmental risks, it's not always an option to use drugs in pregnancy to target pregnancy conditions and improve outcomes. So it's possible that dietary interventions uh, and manipulations, including those that consider microbes, may be a safe alternative to tackle some conditions during pregnancy and prenatal health more generally. So keeping this life cycle perspective in mind, let's look at some examples of how microbes may be involved in reproduction, pregnancy, and development. Now in brief, I'll say that fertilization is likely not happening in a non-sterile environment. For example, we know that there is a seminal bacterial community and its composition has been associated with semen health and male fertility. And at least in emerging animal studies, we're also learning that consumption of high fat diets can influence the seminal fluid microbiome. Uh, there are also distinct reproduct or microbial com communities along the female reproductive tract, and this includes the cervix, uh, fallopian tubes, and the uterine fluid. And all of these are distinct from the vaginal microbiome that's now been well characterized. These specific taxa in these communities have been associated with reproductive tract diseases, uh, rates of implantation, uh, pregnancy, and live births. So clinically, the microbiome, I think, needs to be considered in the context of fertility, and that's probably also including assisted reproductive technologies, where we know that the microenvironment of the gametes and the embryo are very different than in natural conception. And what about the very early stages of embryogenesis and, and early fetal development? 
Well, before the placenta is established, the maternal gut and the microbes in the gut play an important, but in my view, highly underappreciated role in terms of um, matern uh, maternal health status, including nutritional status, and as such, uh, development of the fetus. Now, an important example may be related to uh, some key micronutrients. For example, folates, vitamin B12, particularly strains of lactobacilli and bifidobacteria, we know many of these are known to or have the potential to produce folate and B12. And some of these strains can increase their vitamin production uh, when paired with prebiotic fiber. We also know that some high fiber diets alone have been shown in the non-pregnant individual to associate with higher circulating levels of folate, as well as higher folate content in stool. So why talk about these B vitamins? Well, these micronutrients are particularly important in the context of pregnancy because they're critical for fetal and placental growth and development. We know that rapidly dividing tissues, for example, have a high folic acid requirement. And in addition, many of these lactobacilli and bifidobacteria produce uh, the building blocks of our DNA, the purines and the pyrimidines that are also required for these rapidly developing tissues. And even more specifically, we know how important folic acid and other B vitamins are in the prevention of neural tube defects. Interestingly, in Canada and many other countries, there are still many cases of neural tube defects, including spina bifida, that occur in women with normal blood folate levels. And so this suggests that the pathogenesis of neural tube defects doesn't necessarily only lie in insufficient intake of these micronutrients, but perhaps is situated downstream uh, in maternal or fetal folate metabolism. And therefore it's possible in my view that the gut is playing a role here. And this is something our group is actually studying. In brief, um, there are other microbes that exist during pregnancy. For example, gestational tissues are likely not sterile as once thought. Um, some groups have shown that the placenta harbors low abundant bacteria, although other groups contest this, instead suggesting that these bacteria may be sources of contamination or just low levels of circulating DNA. Um, now, it's important to note that the presence of um, bacterial DNA alone is not indicative of a microbial community with biologic activity. So we don't know if these gestational tissues actually have microbiomes, and if they do, uh, what purpose they serve in reproduction and development. And even if a microbiome is present, the health benefits to the host, uh, in this case, not only the pregnancy, but also the fetus, do need to be established. So just as required uh, when determining whether a microbe functions as a probiotic, we need to know um, the health benefits of the microbiome in these tissues. And I'd also say that if gestational tissue microbiomes exist, whether they could be influenced uh, by maternal health state or diet, for example, also needs to be established. So some studies have associated maternal conditions like uh, gestational diabetes to altered placental microbiomes, but we don't really have a clear picture of the clinical relevance of these relationships just yet. And what about in utero colonization? Well, this is a contentious topic. Uh, there are many parties on the for side as well as the against side, uh, both based on technical evidence and uh, philosophical reasoning. Um, and that could take up an entire presentation. But what I wanted to highlight in brief was what I think everybody uh, generally agrees on. And that typically the initial uh, major microbial seeding process begins at birth when the fetus leaves the uterus. And although, as I just mentioned, uh, that bacteria have been identified in amniotic fluid and placenta and fetal cord blood, um, as well as other parts of the reproductive tract and seminal plasma, uh, the majority of colonization of the infant gut does occur through the act of being born, even if there is exposure to microbial DNA um, prior to birth, as some studies indeed have suggested. So what we do know is that babies who are born vaginally have a different microbiome than babies who are born via C-section. And vaginally born babies' guts are dominated by lactobacillus and bifidobacterium. And notably, a healthy vaginal microbiome is also dominated by lactobacillus species. So it's likely that the vaginally born infant is acquiring its microbes from those that are shared between the maternal vagina and the rectum. But in contrast, C-section born babies have gut microbiomes that are dominated including those from Staphylococcus and Clostridium. 
And these babies don't primarily become colonized by microbes reported to be in utero. And there's also a delay in colonization of their guts from uh, genera that are likely to originate from the maternal gut. And I think these ideas about in utero colonization or rather lack thereof are uh, further substantiated from another study in newborns where gastric aspirate samples were collected within one hour of birth during routine placement of nasogastric or orogastric tubes. And what this study showed, if we first look at the, the plot on the top, was that samples from uh, C-section delivered babies shared a significant microbial content with negative controls. And this wouldn't be the case um, if these microbes were present in the amniotic fluid and they were colonizing the fetal gut, because we know that the fetus swallows large volumes of amniotic fluid towards the end of pregnancy. And further, it was found that there was higher microbial load in vaginally delivered uh, babies' uh, gastric aspirates compared to those delivered by C-section. Although overall samples from many infants had a uh, low microbial load in this study near the edge of the detection limit of the assay, again, suggesting that uh, in utero colonization is not a major factor. So besides mode of delivery, what else influences infant gut microbial colonization and composition? And what are the critical windows of acquisition and shaping of the offspring gut microbiome? Well, we're learning from uh, recent studies about some of these key factors and the windows in which uh, plasticity occurs. So here are data from a study that came out a couple of years ago, a longitudinal study on just under a thousand children between three and 36 months of age, uh, where over 12,000 stool samples were sequenced. And this is part of the larger study, Teddy study called the environmental determinants of diabetes in the young. And uh, what these data are showing are horizontal bars that show the variance in the microbiome that's explained by different factors in the environment listed here on the y-axis on the left. So those that influence the child's microbiome. And as you can see, there's several factors denoted by the stars here uh, that's significantly associated with levels of bacterial genera and species, particularly in the first 36 months of a child's life. And the most notable of these being whether the infant was breastfed. But it's not just which bacteria are there, uh, but also, and most importantly, what they're doing. And this study also found that the metabolic potential of these bacteria was exclusively associated with the composition of breast milk, whether it be exclusive receipt or partial receipt of breast milk in the first three to 14 months of a child's life. So again, this is important because if certain factors influence the function of the gut microbiome, which may impact, for example, um, the ability of the microbiome to produce or metabolize nutrients or provide immune protection, this will have implications for the physiology and the health of that host. And ultimately, this group suggested that the developing gut microbiome undergoes three distinct phases of um, progression or maturation, a developmental phase, uh, a transitional phase, and then a stable phase at about 30 to 46 months of life. So what is it about breast milk that might explain these changes in the infant gut? Well, probably it's the human milk oligosaccharides or the uh, HMOs, which are complex indigestible sugars and a major component of human milk. They have immune modulatory properties and influence uh, development of the infant gut microbiome as well as health trajectories. And it's an absolutely fascinating topic and we don't have time to go into it today. So I strongly suggest that you visit a recent webinar uh, hosted by AE Pro ProBio and linked to here on YouTube where you can learn more about HMOs. Um, and as I said earlier, recall we need to establish whether microbiomes for both uh, the mother and the developing child could, could be influenced by maternal diet or health states. And this is certainly an emerging area of study, but um, early evidence suggests that both the maternal gut and breast milk microbiomes can be discriminated based on what a mother eats. So here are some data that show the breast milk microbiome of mums at about one to two weeks after delivery and show that they can be differentiated based on the uh, maternal consumption of plant protein, fiber, and carbohydrates shown here in the green cluster uh, versus microbiomes of mothers who consumed high levels of animal protein lipids, um, for example, in the red cluster here. And these maternal diet clusters also explain much of the differences in the composition of the breast milk microbiomes, at least in the population in this study seen in the top. 
and specific dietary nutrients. Again, types of fiber, proteins, and lipids also influence the relative abundance levels of specific uh, microbes. So similarly, when looking at the maternal gut, as opposed to the breast milk microbiome in the previous data, around the time of delivery, there are key features, including maternal dietary intakes of fats, carbohydrates, and proteins, and abundance levels of specific bacteria that can discriminate mothers. And the effects of maternal diet extend to the newborn gut microbiome as seen in this heat map below, uh, where at least in this cohort, it was found that higher maternal intake of short chain fatty acids was significantly associated with lower proteobacteria and higher firmicutes, whilst higher maternal intake of fiber and vegetable protein was associated with lower um, levels of bacteroidetes in um, the, uh, the neonatal gut microbiome. But are there any clinical um, relevance to these changes? Well, it looks like there might be. This same study then observed uh, that the maternal gut microbial clusters, so cluster one and cluster two that you see here, and mode of delivery can impact growth trajectories in the infant. And this obviously could have implications for risk of uh, overweight and obesity. So what they found was that both BMI Z scores shown on the left and weight for length Z scores at 18 months of a child's age were associated with a mother's uh, microbiome cluster. And especially for infants born by cesarean section, um, they were at greatest risk of having high BMI and weight for length. And the investigators of this study did um, a lot of other analyses, including adjusting for uh, mode of delivery, antibiotic exposure, uh, pregestational BMI, and feeding method, and found that babies who are born to maternal cluster one mothers had a higher BMI and uh, Z score at one and 18 months, and were at greatest risk for overweight at 18 months. So these and other data suggest that diet can influence maternal infant microbiomes. And I think then raise the question, are the maternal gut microbes a target to prevent poor maternal nutritional status or adverse pregnancy outcomes or even adverse fetal and infant outcomes? And certainly beyond diet, could microbes, beneficial microbes play a role here? So I think that brings us to think about exogenous microbes like probiotics and other dietary factors like prebiotics, which can increase bioavailability of micronutrients through several mechanisms. And therefore they represent an avenue for potentially alleviating poor nutritional status and improving perinatal health. And one could then imagine uh, a suboptimally or malnourished or micronutrient uh, uh, insufficient or deficient woman and, um, and how they could benefit from beneficial microbes or probiotics or even prebiotics. But uh, I think it's important to note that one's response to these will depend on many factors, including the composition and function of one's own microbiome, uh, certainly diet, as well as other aspects of health status. And another reason why I think we need to consider women and their microbes in perinatal health is because female consumers are um, a group that are highly likely or highly receptive to nutrition modified and functional foods, particularly dairy products. And whilst there are geographical differences, large proportions of pregnant people do use probiotics. And here I'm showing data from uh, one Australian study where most women indicated they would be prepared to use uh, probiotic during pregnancy, particularly if they were already using vitamins, uh, believed probiotics were effective and were vulnerable to gastrointestinal symptoms or disease. And importantly, those surveyed here didn't think there were side effects from uh, their consumption. So we've just completed a systematic review um, that's under revision, and you can visit the preprint here to really synthesize the evidence on adverse effects related to the intake of probiotics, prebiotics, or symbiotics during pregnancy and after pregnancy. And there are adverse effects that have been reported in both groups receiving interventions and control or placebo, but our meta-analysis of the available data has indeed shown that these products are safe for use in pregnancy and lactation. So to wrap up, I think it's important to remember that our health trajectories start early. And because of this, we really should consider our environments, various exposures and interventions long before pregnancy, certainly during pregnancy and after pregnancy. And also consider how health states uh, might affect one's microbiomes and nutrient status, as well as vice versa, uh, across reproduction, 
pregnancy, and development. And of course, because there are key factors in early life, like nutrition or diet, uh, that influence host health and the microbiome, and especially because that motivation to improve health in pregnancy is high and women are accepting of uh, using probiotics and other functional foods. I think those of us who interact with patients should consider taking a nutritional history, should consider asking about pre and probiotic consumption, and obviously need to know uh, where to go for evidence-informed information. And uh, I truly say this without influence, AE ProBio is, is the gold standard source for this. Uh, this uh, moment I will take to introduce our second speaker. First of all, thank you. Uh, it's always amazing. I don't want to be even participating as a host. I like to sit and listen to you for the rest of the day. Uh, it's always so much to learn from our, from our esteemed speakers, but let's move on. Um, the next speaker is uh, Dr. Nardine Nakla, and uh, Dr. Nakla is a pharmacist and academic with a keen interest in minor ailments and self-care. Uh, she received the Doctorate of Pharmacy degree from Albany College of Pharmacy, and she's licensed to practice in Ontario and New York, and is a faculty member at the University of Waterloo School of Pharmacy. Dr. Nakla has spent the past 12 years designing and delivering curricular content on the assessment of self-treating patients and common illness management using non-prescription products. She has spoken at provincial, national, and international meetings on these subjects, and also has authored six chapters for my minor ailment references we all use in our practices. Uh, Dr. Nakla is the owner of independent pharmacy and practices as a community pharmacist with a focus on the provision of expanded scope services. Uh, she's also effective, enthusiastic, and knowledgeable educator dedicated to and actively involved in the education and empowerment of the community-based patients and healthcare providers. Just last week, she received the prestigious Ontario Pharmacists Association Bowl of Hygieia Award, recognized as true leader and respected valued teacher. So welcome, Dr. Nakla. Thank you for that kind introduction, Dragana, and for the invitation to speak today. Uh, I also want to thank Kristen for that excellent overview on the early development of the microbiome, uh, the microbiota and factors influencing it. So thank you so much, Kristen. We're going to shift gears a little bit and look at possible interventions using probiotics during breastfeeding and in the early infancy period. So this component of today's presentation will provide an overview of how probiotics can benefit mothers, specifically when it comes to the pain and challenges that they may experience when breastfeeding. We'll uh, also talk about the evidence for use of probiotics in infants, and then conclude, on, uh, conclude with some information on where you can turn for reliable resources to facilitate some evidence-based decision-making when you're recommending probiotics or receiving questions about probiotics. So one of the greatest joys of motherhood is breastfeeding. And this bonding activity really provides the baby with the optimal mix of nutrients, antibodies, and friendly bacteria uh, to prevent illness and to support nutritional, emotional, and immunologic health and development. And while most of us agree that breastfeeding is best for baby, conferring both short-term and long-term uh, benefits, it's not always possible or feasible because breastfeeding is influenced by many complex physiological and psychosocial factors. The most common reasons mothers give for stopping breastfeeding before the minimum recommended time of the six months of exclusive breastfeeding are not enough milk, and difficulty or pain with breastfeeding technique. So let's first explore the not enough milk issue. There are health conditions in both the mother and in the infant that can cause low milk supply. So some maternal risk factors for low supply are found here on this slide, and they include things like prior breast surgery and insufficient glandular tissue, or things that can influence hormone levels. So that includes things like postpartum hemorrhage, hypothyroidism, diabetes, obesity, uh, polycystic ovary syndrome, or cigarette smoking as well. Infant risk factors include things like cleft palate, and a lip or a tongue tie, and prematurity. All of those can decrease the infant's ability to uh, stimulate an adequate 
uh, milk production. So signs of low milk supply from an infant's perspective are those um, that can suggest milk transfers being reduced. So for example, lack of satiety following feeding. So newborns typically feed at least eight times uh, in 24 hours after the first 24 hours. So, you know, if it's occurring more often than that, it could be lack of satiety there. Baby's not alert, active or meeting developmental milestones. Uh, baby has poor weight gain. So on average, breastfed babies put on about an ounce, um, so, so 30 grams a day or five ounces a week until they're about three months of age, or even potential weight loss can indicate signs of low milk supply, of course. And then inappropriate output as evidenced by decreased diaper changes. So newborns really should be going through six to 10 diapers in a day. So some of the other warning signs and risk factors for breastfeeding difficulties are listed here on this slide. Um, and as you will see, there's you know, previous breast surgery, uh, psychosocial issues. As a pharmacist, I can't help but focus in on and, and zone in on the uh, maternal medication here. And that could be associated with reduced supply of milk or even just shortened duration of breastfeeding. So those include both prescription agents so things like estrogen containing contraceptives, uh, dopamine agonists like bromocryptine and diuretics, as well as non-prescription medications that you can pick up over the counter. So for example, um, first generation antihistamines like diphenhydramine and pseudoephedrine, which is an oral decongestant. And then nicotine and alcohol can also um, do this. So now I'm just going to uh, move my way down this slide to mastitis for the sake of time. So mastitis is a common but very painful inflammatory condition of the breast tissue uh, with most cases occurring within the first 12 weeks postpartum. So lactational mastitis can be difficult to define because there's various definitions in the literature, but a generally accepted diagnosis of the condition is inflammation of the breast tissue, usually resulting from a plug duct or a breast infection, which causes severe pain and flu-like symptoms. In rare cases could cause septicemia and the formation of a breast abscess as well. The reported global incidence varies, but it's estimated to usually affect under 10%, although up to 33% of lactating mothers. Mastitis is distressing for women. It's also a common reason for them to stop breastfeeding earlier than intended, which causes, of course, babies and uh, mothers to miss out on the many benefits of breastfeeding. This condition is often treated with antibiotics. So, um, because it is an inflammatory condition, uh, research and the interest in the human microbiome and probiotics and their potential as anti-inflammatory agents uh, is really emerging now. And that's really inspired this interest and in, in additional research in the use of these probiotics as an alternative to antibiotics to treat or prevent lactational mastitis in women. So here we see uh, a study of 352 women with symptoms of lactational mastitis, and they looked at the efficacy of orally administered lactobacillus fermentum CECT5716, and that was evaluated and compared with the efficacy of traditional, <clears throat> excuse me, antibiotic therapy. So on day zero, the mean bacterial counts in milk samples of the groups, as well as the number of participants that had pain or discomfort were very, very similar. However, um, by day 21, as you will see on the far right, a greater bacterial reduction occurred in women who were receiving probiotics compared with antibiotics. There were also statistically significant differences between the breast pain scores in women who were assigned to take probiotics, and then the breast pain score in the antibiotic group at day 21. So um, that is notable. And then uh, the other thing is that some of the women who were receiving antibiotics developed some adverse effects. So for example, vaginal candidiasis, whereas this effect was not reported in the probiotic groups. So the authors concluded that the use of probiotic appears to be an efficient alternative to the use of commonly prescribed antibiotics for the treatment of infectious mastitis during lactation. So this kind of summarizes all of that. 
And it also uh, references a study by another researcher, Jose, uh, which him and his, his group conducted a randomized double-blinded controlled study with four study groups, three of whom received the same probiotic strain at different doses. Uh, and then the fourth group who received a placebo of maldodextrin for three weeks. And the main outcome of the study was looking at staphylococcus counts in the breast milk. At the end of the study, there was a significant decrease in the amount of staphylococcus observed in the probiotic groups compared with the baseline, um, whereas the control groups really maintained similar levels over time. There was also a significant decrease in the pain score among uh, the groups that received the three different doses of the probiotics compared with the control group. What was interesting here is he used the same strain and there was uh, no dose response effect could really be observed here. Um, so all three doses induced similar effects. So the authors here concluded that yes, uh, L-fermentum CECT5716 is certainly an efficient treatment for breast pain uh, during lactation that's associated with a high level of staphylococcus in breast milk, which is commonly seen with mastitis. So you may be wondering if this specific probiotic strain is readily available, and the answer is yes, but there's actually only one branded product containing this ingredient in North America. So the Canadian brand name is Materna Optilac. In the US, the product is referred to as Alactia. So uh, Materna Optilac isn't yet listed in the Clinical Guide to Probiotics in Canada. It's only been available for a few months, but it will be added at the mid-year update later this month. The US-based probiotic guide already has this product listed as you can see in the screenshot attached here. So mothers who are unable to breastfeed their infants offer suffer from feelings of guilt or inadequacy and, and pediatricians agree that a baby needs to be fed. So if breast milk is not available, you know, formula will do just fine. And a fed baby is a happy baby. And that's something we tend to lose sight of sometimes as clinicians um, focusing on the importance of breast milk, but really a fed baby is a happy baby. So with more research looking at the importance of the gut microbiota, especially in the early days, there's an increasing number of infant formulas that now have added probiotics in them. So some of the commonly used probiotic species that have been studied in early life are from the genus of the bifidobacteria and of the genus lactobacilli. The three strains that are highlighted here on this slide are the ones that have commonly been added to infant formula. So uh, B. lactis B12, lactobacillus ruderi, and lactobacillus rhamnosus gg. So let's look at a few of those strains with the demonstrated impact in infants. These are all described in the Canadian Pediatric Society's position statement that was just updated a couple of years ago that titled Using Probiotics in the Pediatric Population. So we'll start with B. lactis BD12. So this is a very interesting strain that was identified and isolated from a mother's breast milk, and it's predominantly found in the gut of breastfed infants, where it constitutes most of the microbiota, as Kristen mentioned a little bit ago. This probiotic strain is the world's most documented bifidobacterium, and it's described in hundreds of scientific publications. So the weight of research which supports the use of this strain suggests that it really may have numerous potential benefits in the pediatric population, specifically in supporting the developing microbiota, immune system, and establishing good gut barrier function. So examples of products containing this strain may be found on this slide and of course in the clinical guide. So in Canada, Nestle Good Start Plus, there's a one and a two. The two is for those who are six months of age and older. Um, both are powdered formulas requiring reconstitution, but those have this specific strain in them. In the U.S., it's Good Start Extensive uh, HA or the Gentle one. So now let's look at our next one here. <clears throat> So before we talk about lactobacillus rotary, I want to talk about the infantile colic's criteria. So this is a very quick review of what infantile colic is. 
It's very common. We've heard this a lot. Uh, it's a functional gastrointestinal disorder of early infancy. It affects about one in five infants under the age of three months. And it's characterized by these long bouts of crying and hard to soothe behavior. It's also associated with premature cessation of breastfeeding as well as maternal depression. So historically, it was most commonly defined by Wessel's rule of three, which was named after the pediatrician, uh, Dr. Morris Wessel. And it count constituted of crying and or fussing for more than three hours in a day, for more than three days in a week, and for more than three weeks straight in an otherwise healthy and well-fed infant. We've really shifted away from this definition and, and we prefer the Rome 4 criteria, which is similar, but doesn't cite that arbitrary number of three in its definition. So on average here for uh, infants with colic, the crying peaks at about six weeks of age and then usually diminishes by about 12 weeks of age. So despite the fact that this is a self-limiting ailment, uh, infantile colic has a substantial deleterious impact on society by negatively affecting parental health and leading to substantial health expenditures uh, due to the consultation for these issues here. All right, so on this slide here, you will see that there is uh, a variety of therapies listed here. So uh, uh, lactobacillus rotary is a DSM-17989 is the probiotic with the strongest scientific evidence in infantile colic. So really besides that, our possibilities to treat colic are just so limited. You know, cymethicone is listed there, sucrose is listed there as well, but this is really um, the one that has the strongest evidence behind its use. The etiology of colic is, remains elusive. So uh, that's why we, again, have very limited management options. Although there's now all this increasing interest in the potential relationship between the gut microbiome and this disorder. So the number of studies in this space have increased as well. So let's look at one of them. So here are some of the details of a 2018 meta-analysis that included four double-blind randomized controlled trials involving 345 infants with colic. 174 were given the probiotic and 171 were given placebo. Both delivered orally uh, to infants who met Wessel's modified definition of colic. So on this slide, you'll see the baseline characteristics of those included trials. Um, and you can see here that they included mostly breastfed infants with one trial, including uh, some formula fed infants as well. And the objectives were to determine if the probiotic effectively reduces crying and or fussing in infants with colic when compared to a placebo at 21 days post randomization. This is what they found. So here you can see the actual mean crying and or fussing durations by treatment groups at seven, 14 and 21 days. And as you can see, the crying and or fussing duration was reduced in both the probiotic and placebo groups, but was significantly shorter in the probiotic group at all follow-up time points. In fact, the probiotic group was almost twice as likely as the placebo group to experience treatment success at all time points. So the authors concluded here, oh, one more thing um, before I talk about the conclusion. So the intervention effects were dramatic in breastfed infants, um, but they were insignificant for formula fed infants. So the authors then concluded that lactobacillus rotari DSM-17938 is effective and can be recommended for breastfed infants with colic. Um, and its role in formula fed infants with colic does require more research. So for the sake of time, I won't go over this study, but this was another researcher and her team who uh, looked at this double, double blinded placebo controlled randomized trial um, of the same exact probiotic strain and using the same strain and dose. Um, and what they did here that's unlike some of the other studies that I just mentioned, uh, was that they looked at and they sought to determine if daily oral supplementation with this strain during the first three months of life could actually prevent uh, colic and can reduce crying time that way. And so they enrolled breastfed and formula fed infants here and they received the therapy for 90 days. 
Um, the results of the study were very encouraging. They found crying time was significantly decreased. They also saw that bowel movements were more frequent at the 28 day mark and the 90 day mark for those taking the probiotic versus controls. Regurgitation was found to be less at 90 days. Um, and even taking into account the cost of the probiotic, the probiotic group still incurred fewer overall costs here. And so this just lent additional support to the potential use of this strain for infantile colic. So here again, examples of infant formulas, toddler foods, probiotic supplements that contain this strain. Again, everything is included in the probiotic guide. And so last but not least, we're gonna talk about lactobacillus rhamnosus GG. So this specific strain has been studied and used as a probiotic to prevent the growth of harmful bacteria in the stomach and intestines. It's been extensively studied across various health areas uh, in newborns, preterm infants, children, pregnant women, you name it. And really uh, no safety issues have been found. So this LGG strain supports the intestinal barrier function by helping um, intestinal integrity and supporting the immune system. Because of that, it's been added to infant formulas as well, specifically ones that are used for um, children with a cow's milk allergy. So here in 2012, some researchers sought out to explore the very uh, well-documented link between LGG and the immune system and whether supplementation of an extensively hydrolyzed casein formula, EHCF, as you'll see on the slide, with LGG could affect tolerance acquisition to cow's milk protein. And so they enrolled infants, um, ages vary from one to 12 months, who were strongly suspected as having a cow's milk allergy, but were still receiving cow's milk protein. Those were the ones that they enrolled in the study. And they were randomly assigned to one of two groups. So the first group received that EHCF, uh, and then the group two, seen in the blue line there, uh, received EHCF containing LGG. So on the slide, this Kaplan-Meier curve shows that the infants in the group two, so the blue group, um, they had a higher probability of acquiring tolerance at six and 12 months compared with the subjects in group one as seen in the orange line. So they concluded here that the lactobacillus rhamnosus GG when added to infant formula drives faster resolution of cow's milk allergy and those infants who receive it uh, not only get there faster but more completely than those who are just given the extensively hydrolyzed casein formulas alone. So these are some examples of infant formulas and uh, probiotic products containing this specific strain. And so now to wrap up, I wanted to um, talk about some resources for picking the proper probiotic. Did you know that physicians, pharmacists, dietitians, and uh, nutritionists were all listed among the top five influencers when it comes to recommending probiotics or where the uh, consumers or patients are actually seeking this information out? So because of that, and because we have a growing number of products that are available and some contradictory information in the literature, we as healthcare providers are often faced with you know, questions and uncertainty about whether to use a certain strain, a probiotic or not. So let's quickly discuss what resources we have for picking this. We know for certain that the effect of probiotics is both strain and disease specific. However, in Canada, um, we have resources like the Canadian Pediatric Society's position statement that goes ahead and says, yes, we recommend certain probiotics for specific conditions that leave us with some gaps because they don't really state which specific strains to use and in what dose or format as well. And that's really the reason that uh, Jagana and her team in 2008 came up with this project, the Clinical Guide to Probiotic Products, which looks at the established evidence while specifying the strain and assigning it to commercial products that contain those specific strains. So they put all of this in a nice chart format to make it easy for clinicians to quickly look at the evidence and sort through the vast offerings of products on the market. So this very, very comprehensive resource lists the brand names of products, probiotic strain, the dose, um, the number of doses per day, indications in various patient populations, including children. 
And then that same information is also available on the mobile app as well, and it's updated at least annually. So I will leave you with these practical pearls. Um, probiotics may, be, may play a role in supporting health and development, for example, supporting breastfeeding, the prevention and treatment of mastitis, which is very common, supporting an infant's gut microbiota, for example, in babies with colic, resolving some common GI issues in infancy, infancy for example, cow's milk allergy. But when you're selecting a probiotic, keep in mind, not everyone needs a probiotic. And if you are going to use one, look for a specific strain that is supported by the evidence. And then always speak with uh, your healthcare professional and if in doubt, consult the guide. So I'll leave you with this actually, this slide here that I love. So all mothers, but especially first time mothers um, and parents, other caregivers, they really need lots of support and advice and reassurance that they're caring for their babies appropriately. Ooh, sorry about that. That they're caring appropriately and doing everything they can to optimize health outcomes. So we can assist as healthcare providers by being well equipped with both knowledge and tools uh, to answer their questions and to actively screen patients to see if they qualify for evidence-based interventions. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Catherine and uh, Dragana. That is great. Thank you, Nardine. Again, uh, uh, so much information and so much great uh, uh, data and, and evidence and also practical pearls that we can take back to our uh, clinics and offices. So again, uh, we are a bit over time. So we do hope that our presentation on microbiota development and probiotics in the first thousand days maternal and infant health from conception to two years has provided you with valuable information on supporting the development of babies who have diverse and robust microbiota in the early days so they can live a healthy life. Um, I would encourage you to visit aprobio.com as we mentioned throughout the, the, the talk as often because new content is consistently being added and notifications about the clinical guide mid-year update this year will be posted on this website as well. We also hope you enjoyed the session and that you will join us again soon. And this concludes our session. Have an absolutely wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.